Dan's talk is obviously live and he is going to give pose a question very relevant to this meeting. Does the concept of teleonomy solve the problems of organismic purposiveness? <laughs> Over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. I'm just going to share my screen. Let me see. Can you see my slides? Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, I was told um, that there is a sort of a, a law that whenever you find a question in a, in a title, uh, most of the times that you can predict that the answer is going to be no. Um, and in this case, I, I, I'm afraid to say that my talk is going to um, sort of support this, 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 this law. Um, so first of all, before I start, I just want to, to thank uh, profusely um, Dick and, and Peter for inviting me uh, to participate in this in this very stimulating conferences. I, I'm, I'm really honored to be sharing uh, the panel with such an illustrious uh, you know, roster of, 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 of speakers. Um, and I should say that um, I'm not going to be, so unlike some of the other talks, I'm not going to be presenting um, so sort of any any the results of any pro projects or any finished work, um, when uh, Peter and Dick invited me to 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 participate and to give a talk, I I thought uh, hard about what I could um, what what I could talk about, and I decided to maybe sort of the risky option of trying to uh, think from scratch, uh, uh, given um, sort of my other interests that I've pursued, how I would address this question of teleonomy and teleology. Um, so this is uh, what I'm going to present to you today. So it's all very rough and um, tentative, um, but I've, I find it really, really helpful to work uh, through all this material and these ideas, and hopefully by presenting them to you, um, it'll become even more clear where where the work uh, is needed. So um, I should say I'm a I'm a philosopher of biology, but I'm a historically informed philosopher of biology. What that means is that whenever I address a philosophical problem, I really like to. Uh, sink my teeth into the history of the, uh, of, of the concept of the debate. Now, unfortunately, it's really hard to do this with, with, the, with teleology, um, given that I, I really can't think of any other topic that has been most, that, that most ink has been spilled over the, um, than teleology. I mean, I'm not just even talking about the, uh, since the professionalization of philosophy of biology in the 1960s, 1970s, but really, if you look at the history of biological thought, biological philosophy of, throughout the 20th century, there's a huge amount of literature um, and even, I mean, really um, the history of philosophy really also reflects that, 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 that you know, this is an issue that has been uh, concerning those who've been thinking about life since, since antiquity. So I find myself in this very difficult situation of, of being sucked, this, sucked into this uh, black hole of, of, of literature, um, you know, a search in my, in my archives, you know, was, was showing hundreds and hundreds of, of, of hits on, on teleology. So I realized that I would not be able to do what I would normally like to do, which is to sort of um, to, 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 to talk about the history in some sort of coherent way. Uh, in, and um, because really, it's, it's, it's really hard. I find myself sort of in a, in a, in a, in a maze, not knowing how to, how to uh, get out. And, uh, and so what I'm gonna do instead is just um, focus on a distinction that, uh, that I am particularly fond of, that I've written about, um, and see whether what purchase that distinction gives us in, in navigating our way through the complicated history and philosophy of, of, the, of the problem of teleology uh, in, in biology. So that's what I'm gonna try and do uh, uh, with you uh, today. So the, the distinction that I'm referring to is the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic purposiveness. Now, this is not a new distinction. Um, actually, it was championed by some of the most celebrated um, philosophers and biologists um, in history, uh, including Aristotle, uh, uh, Locke, um, Kant, and Cuvier. Um, Kant particularly being uh, important in, uh, for, for in, in this context uh, due to his, the clarity with which he made this distinction and, and the implications that he drew from it. Um, so let's just work out then what, what this amounts to. So the idea is that an entity can be purposive, meaning that it can operate towards the attainment of particular ends in two very different senses. Now, I use the word purposive here rather than purposeful, or, and I, I try to use the term purposive um, in a way that does not uh, in any way imply uh, you know, conscious intent. It can, but it doesn't need to. 
okay? Um, so two ways of, of sort of being purposive or exhibiting purposiveness. Um, an entity is extrinsically purposive, okay? If, um, if it operates towards an end, towards a goal that is external to itself. Um, that is to say that it serves the interests of its maker or its user, um, and it's, it's, it's telos is externally imposed, okay? And we can distinguish this with, uh, from uh, um, intrinsic purposiveness, right? So an, ent an entity can be said to be intrinsically purposive um, if it acts towards its own ends um, and it serves its own interests and its end is sort of internally generated, okay? Now, paradigmatic examples of, uh, of extrinsically purposive systems are machines, right? Like a clock, right? So machines are instruments that we use machines to serve our own ends. The clock tells the time and that's not something that benefits the clock or uh, is in the interest of the clock. If the clock doesn't have interest, it's in the interest of the maker or the user of the clock. Um, I impose the, 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 the tellers on the clock by designing it and by uh, deciding really um, the, the, you know, the normative aspect of its operation, you know, when, when it's working, when it's not working, um, what is working for me basically. Um, and then so this uh, a paradigmatic example, of course, of an intrinsically purposive system as an organism. Um, and this is, of course, already sort of a, a claim that could be disputed, but I think that um, one can make a case that um, all organisms from bacteria to, um, to humans um, um, exhibit this intrinsic purposiveness that really has nothing to do with uh, intention or consciousness or anything like that. Um, and, um, and so we, you know, I think it is possible to talk about, um, about what's in the interest of an organism by looking at how what it does enables it to continue to exist, right? So the, the, the end of the organism, the ultimate end is to continue to stay alive and to reproduce. And so you can sort of evaluate and adjudicate um, functionally, right? What's happening in an organism by, this, by, by identifying how it contributes to uh, the fulfillment of that end, okay? And that's an end that the organism has that is not externally imposed. That doesn't mean you cannot, you know, you, you can't use an organism, you can't use a horse as a means of transportation, for example, but um, all else being equal, um, the horse, uh, physiologically, everything that's happening in it and its behavior uh, can be understood in, 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 uh, uh, in the way that it, um, it serves that goal of the horse continuing to exist over time, okay? So that's the main distinction, which I'm gonna be returning over and over in, in, um, in, in the talk. So it's a pretty important one uh, to keep in mind. So now having that distinction in mind, let's now have a do a sort of quick um, um, exploration of the history, um, uh, history of philosophy and biology and see, uh, see, see how this distinction helps illuminate things. So if you think, if we think of, of the philosophy of nature, uh, the worldviews that were developed um, and defended in antiquity, particularly in ancient Greece, what you find is that you don't always have that, the, 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 this distinction isn't always relevant because um, in a way, uh, uh, you know, both animate and inanimate objects were afforded uh, both kinds of purposiveness. And the reason being that nature as a whole was construed um, as, as alive, as a living organism, um, sometimes with a mind, sometimes not, but importantly, um, you know, everything in nature um, partakes in, in nature's vitality and its purpose, right? So, um, so, and this is sort of the worldview uh, of uh, very general terms, of course, of classical antiquity. Um, Aristotle, of course, is an important figure here. Um, I've noticed he's come up uh, uh, quite a few times already. Um, and it's important to be clear about what um, you know, Aristotle means uh, or how he uses the notion of, of, of final causes. So for him, purposiveness is, is a way of making sense, um, a way of understanding um, an entity. To understand an entity um, or a process, we, um, we examine uh, the function it serves, the goal it serves towards, um, and so on and so forth, the result it produces. Um, so it's important to understand here that uh, purposes uh, for Aristotle are imminent, okay? They're not transcendent, they're, and they're not conscious, and they're not mental. There's no divine plan. God does not really play a role um, as uh, um, some commentators um, have, have uh, claimed. Um, but, and, and um, you know, ends, and this is important, ends don't cause things to happen. Um, I have the exclamation marks here just to uh, really underline this because I think that there's a lot of mis misunderstanding about what Aristotle meant by purpose, um, uh, which is relevant to, to the story I'm telling because, um, you know, there's this idea that, um, that teleology or purposiveness uh, leads to some sort of uh, backwards causation of the future caught in the past. And I don't think that that is a fair 
account or reading of what Aristotle meant or, or even those who followed in his footsteps. So, so it's important, uh, therefore, to not allow ourselves to, um, you know, to develop this straw man that we can then uh, very uh, quickly flick uh, with, a, with a gentle flick, um, um, you know, um, destroy. Um, really, um, the error of Aristotle wasn't to, to propose that organisms were purposive, but rather uh, if, if you know, we can really talk in terms of errors uh, historically to ascribe that purposiveness also to inanimate entities, right? To think, for example, of a falling stone having the purpose of um, reaching uh, the center of the earth when it falls. And, and, and perhaps that's um, probably where we, um, it's sort of easier to make a case for um, Aristotle having, um, you know, being led astray. Uh, um, so what happened uh, then with the scientific revolution? Well, um, it's well known that it led to uh, a total reorientation really of what constitutes an explanation of, of a natural phenomenon. And all appeals to goals and purposes were no longer considered appropriate or legitimate. Um, so, you know, the, the falling stone that I mentioned just earlier uh, was no longer explained by assuming that it moves towards its goal at the center of the earth. Instead, the world was understood as a giant piece of clockwork, a giant complicated machine with all the parts working in a coordinated way in an efficient and regular manner. Um, and which means that of course, because of that regularity, we can objectively quantify um, phenomena and mathematize it and explain everything essentially in terms of matter and motion. And this is of course the worldview, the, mecha the mechani mechanization of the world picture that, that characterizes the scientific revolution, uh, where we sort of eliminate the distinction between uh, the living and the non-living. And we think of the natural as mechanical and mechanical as natural. But it's important to remember, and this is not always uh, remembered, that the scientific revolution only really abolished intrinsic purposes. It didn't really touch uh, the invocation of extrin extrinsic purposes. Teleology survived uh, the 17th century. Um, in fact, this worldview was not only not incompatible with attributions of extrinsic purposes, but actually it necessarily presupposed uh, these attributions, right? Why? Well, because we're dealing with a machine uh, and a machine is, as I've already noted, extrinsically purposive, which means that it's, um, it, it exhibits a design, the agency or the intent or the plan of an external agent, uh, namely God, right? It reflect God's intentions. Um, this has all sort of interesting implications for how we think about um, the epistemology of the 17th century. So, um, you know, it, 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 we realize that really the laws of nature that we're describing um, do not originate within nature. They're not intrinsic to nature. They, they actually are imposed by, from the outside by the, by the designer. Um, and to really to do science, to study nature is to study the work of God, uh, the, you know, the, the beauty and harmony of God's handiwork. Um, uh, you know, uh, Newton said you could study uh, the word of God and the work of God, the word of God through uh, scripture and the work of God through a natural philosophy. Um, and so you've got this sort of um, interesting equation um, or identification of natural philosophy with natural theology, right? In the sense that learning about, um, you know, doing science is a way of demonstrating the existence of God because we are essentially showing and uh, identifying um, the, um, you know, the beauty and harmony and perfection of God's work. And of course, natural theology, I'm sure will be familiar to most of you as uh, the title of, uh, of a uh, important book by uh, William Paley. It also led to the publication of a number of books under the heading of Bridgewater Treatises, uh, which were commissioned in the 19th century to a uh, number of scientists in different areas who sort of looked at nature and do, did that in order to, to sort of provide new sort of evidence uh, for the existence, existence of God. Um, so, 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 okay, so the point to him then is that while intrinsic purposes were purged from nature, it remained acceptable to infer from it the ex extrinsic purposes, intentions, plans of God. Now, what happened with Darwin? Well, of course, Darwin, without Darwin totally changed this because with his theory it became possible to explain this adaptedness of organisms to the environment without having to presuppose the existence of a divine creator. We no longer needed to appeal to that. Natural selection offered a means to uh, account for this extrinsic purposiveness uh, in biology in a way that made no reference to plans or conscious intentions, right? Uh, natural selection makes, makes, made it possible to explain adaptation, which of course is a concept that predates Darwin and evolutionary theory, um, without having to invoke design. Eyes then could be understood to be made for seeing without having to presuppose that they were designed for seeing, right? Um, but what's interesting is that there's no really consensus about um, how we should think about uh, what Darwin really did to this notion of extrinsic purposiveness that I've been uh, mentioning. Um, did he show it to be unnecessary or unscientific, or did he instead uh, uh, provide a naturalistic way of unproblematic, of unproblematically talking about it? 
Um, this is sort of interesting. If you look at the uh, reception of The Origin of Species um, uh, upon its publication, what you find is that you have um, you know, uh, people blaming and praising Darwin for both for either promoting or undermining teleology. This is taken from a, a paper by John Beatty from, the, from 1990, where he showed that uh, you, know, uh, you have authors that, that, that fit in, in all the, in, in the four quadrants. Um, and so this is very, very confusing, of course. So um, um, surely this must mean either that they've misunderstood the theory or that they understand different things by teleology. And this sort of confusion persists and continues to this day. I mean, uh, Hull, one of the um, founders of modern philosophy of biology, um, simply just stated, declared that evolutionary theory did away with teleology, and that is that. But then if you look at you know, the general biology and philosophy, you find papers such as this one by James Lennox. Darwin was a teleologist. The response by Michael Giesling, Darwin's language may seem teleological, but his thinking is another matter. So what's going on here? I mean, there's clearly uh, a lot of uh, sort of misunderstanding about how we, how we should think about what Darwin did to teleology. So this is, the, I think, the things that we can say uh, for certain happened. He vanished the conscious purposiveness that is implied in the theistic doctrine of special creation, right? So that we no longer have to appeal to that. Uh, and in that sense, that sort of extrinsic purposiveness is no longer appropriate. Um, the evolutionary process can be, is not really goal directed towards anywhere. And the outcomes are not directed towards predetermined goals. So in that sense, again, extrinsic purposiveness, if we're going to keep this notion is quite different from that um, sort of theistic uh, 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 version. Um, now, of course, it's true that evolutionists do talk about design, uh, but they do tend to do so uh, only metaphorically. Sometimes they talk about the appearance of design. Um, so, so you know, this complicates matters even more because, of course, you have the language, the sort of the pre pre evolutionary language, still with us in contemporary evolutionary biology. Uh, but when you press biologists, they'll say, "We well, you know I don't really mean it literally." Or if they do mean it liter literally, then um, you know they have to sort of completely redefine what design is in a way that doesn't uh, imply a preconceived plan, which is sort of difficult, which is why sometimes you have this sort of oxymoron, oxymoron or, or, or problematic, uh, problematic notion of a design without a, without a designer, you know. Um, so, so this sort of complicates, muddies the waters a bit. Um, and then there's another sense in which we can say that natural selection is purposive in the simple sense that it relates to the analogy that Darwin drew himself with, with, with domestic breeding in the sense that traits are selected for and they're selected for externally by the environment due to the adva adaptive advantage that they confer on the individuals that exhibit them. So, so this I, an idea can be framed or understood teleologically as well, which is why I think, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, there's so much confusion here. Um, but okay, so that's all I wanna say for the moment about intrins extrinsic purposefulness, but what about intrinsic purposefulness, right? So regardless of what happens with, with how we think about extrinsic purposefulness, the issue really is that this discussion leaves totally untouched the other half of the problem. And I think arguably the more interesting other half of the problem. Um, now, what can we say sort of briefly just off the cuff? Well, we can say that historically, physics did really well when it decided to relinquish its appeal to, uh, to intrinsic purposes, right? It was a good thing for the development of physics for physicists not to have to ask why it is that the stone wants to uh, fall. Um, that's, that seems uh, uh, fair enough. But, but the thing is, when you look at biology, it's a totally different scenario. Um, uh, in fact, biology never really got, 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 got through the, uh, the revolt from Aristotelianism. And in fact, even the most cursory look at the history of biology uh, you know, shows that virtually every generation of biological researchers since the 17th century uh, has benefited in some way from rediscovering Aristotle's appeal to intrinsic purposes. You know, we sort of can't do without it. Um, and at the same time, of course, most of these have felt an ease about doing this because such appeals continue to be deemed incompatible with the mechanicist precepts of modern science that I've just discussed, right? So um, if you want to do good science, you're not supposed to appeal to teleology or, or intrinsic purposes. And yet, if you want to study biology, it's very hard to do it without appealing to intrinsic purposes. So you've got this sort of dilemma. And it's a dilemma that hasn't really been properly, I think, recognized or as much as it should, I think, by the in the Anglophone discourse on teleology and biology, given that this discourse, uh, both the contemporary discourse and I think also historically has been really, really preoccupied uh, mostly with, um, with extrinsic purpose of this, right? Um, and, and thinking about the problem of design and natural theology. And if you look at, so if you compare the traditions, right? Compare the British biology, history of British biology, with history of German biology, you get a very sort of different view. Um, the, the Germans uh, being um, historically, traditionally far more interested in, in, in the problem of intrinsic purpose of this. Um, there's a nice quote actually from, from Schopenhauer. So this is uh, uh, before Dar Darwin's Origin of Species where he's actually complaining about this. He says, look, you know, if you, if you look at the Englishman, the Bridgewater Treatise, man, these are the people who worked on natural theology. 
to them, teleology is at once also theology and every instance of purpose recognized in nature. Instead of trying to work out what it means, they break at once into the childish cry, design, design. And he says, the ignorance of the Kantian philosophy is principally responsible for this whole outcast position of the English. This is remarkable because I think uh, this sentiment uh, is, would still up, would, you know, would have also applied to the literature in the 70s, 80s, perhaps not so much now, but until recently. Um, so what's so special about Kant and his uh, appeal to uh, his understanding of intrinsic purposes? Well, he has this idea of organisms, he introduces this technical term of a natural purpose, which is, we cannot be explained mechanistically because it appears to be both cause and effects in itself. Um, he says that the distinctive features of, organ of the organism, such as reproduction, growth, and regeneration, um, really reflects a complex mutual dependence between the parts and the parts and the whole that can only be grasped teleologically, not mechanistically. Um, this is all in his third critique, in the Critique of Judgment, by the way, in the second part, uh, which is devoted to teleology. Um, so, you know, he notes that the parts of an organism don't just depend on one another for their function, they're also produced by one another in the service of the whole. So this is also where he... Uh, coins the notion of self-organization, which has, um, of course, become very important uh, in subsequent history of biology. In like, unlike machines that are merely organized organisms are self-organizing and self-regenerating. Now, importantly for Kant, this assumption of intrinsic purposiveness is really something that we sort of have to, we just have to assume, we have to take for granted. Um, and it is something he warns that we should not regard as an objective property of organisms. It's just something that we have to project onto them to understand them as, as observers. It's a sort of necessary heuristic. Um, and although uh, you know, Kant's ideas were very influential, um, very few biologists after Kant were able to sort of resist that temptation to view intrinsic purposes only as a heuristic to follow Kant's um, you know, warning. Um, and this is you know, nicely uh, uh, sort of recounted in a number of, 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 of history of biology books from the 19th, uh, or books looking at the history of German biology in the 19th century, such as uh, this one by Timothy Lenoir, a classic, Strategy of Life. Um, um, really, for many biologists, for most biologists, intrinsic purposes was was one of the most obvious features of organisms. You know, it, it wasn't uh, it, to deny the, obje the objective existence of this property was really to decouple their experience of seeing or you know experiencing life and studying it. So you got this sort of re retreat to the to the constitutive understanding of teleology rather than the regulative, as Kant had hoped. Um, and this, of course, relates to the history of vitalism. Really, when you look at vitalist appeals, um, you know, vitalist accounts in the nineteenth century, what's happening is that they're trying to draw attention to this. To this property of organisms, which is so important. This is what they're trying to do. They're then trying not to forget about it, not to dismiss it, and to say, well, with this has to be at the forefront of our investigation. We need to come to terms with it. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the positive project of vitalism wasn't successful, wasn't convincing, but the negative critique of the mechanistic um, sort of tendency to forget or, or neglect on just I think is, is an important one. And by you know, the mid 19th century, things began to change. Vitalistic explanations began to come to fall out of favor. Mechanistic explanations became more and more favored. Um, and um, and so essentially, you know, the, the, the problem of intrinsic was, 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 was cast to one side. This problem stayed with us throughout the 20th century. Um, vitalism by then had become totally discredited despite efforts such as those by Driesch to, uh, to revive it. Um, in the early 20th century, you have an attempt by a number of theoretical biologists known as organicists, people like uh, Russell, Woodger, Bert Lamphy, who try to, to come to terms with intrinsic purposes in a way that would not make the mistake of the vitalists in a naturalistic way, but uh, the efforts didn't gain much traction. This is a, a wonderful book by Russell, 1945, called The Directiveness of Organic Activities, which is devoted to this problem. And of course, all the while, biologists in the, in the lab and in their, in their work would co continue to appeal to this purpose of language, finding it almost impossible not to do so. You know, uh, prompting Haldane to to quip in this mem this memorable quip that teleology is like a mistress to a biologist that he cannot live without her, but he's unwilling to be seen with her in public. Right. So what happens then in the second half of the 20th century? Well, you got attempts to eliminate and replace or legitimize uh, teleology and biology by both biologists and philosophers. Uh, the most influential one is the one sort of very pertinent to this to this meeting. Uh, by, uh, by Colin Pittendrick um, in 1958, to suggest this notion of teleonomy to capture the purposes of organisms without invoking the sort of unpalatable, what he considered to be the unpalatable connotations of the traditional concept of teleology, right? So what, what is Pittendrick up to? What's he trying to do? Well, he's, he, he's writing in a context of, of adaptation. Um, he notes that definitions of adaptation tend to connote that aura of design, purpose, and directiveness that he says, since Aristotle seemed to characterize the living thing. Um, and you know, so he's really trying to, to rehabilitate this notion of adaptation. Um, 
he notes that this, not, that this notion was not simply clarified with the postulation of, uh, you know, with the publication of the origin of species. Uh, it did not sort of rescue adaptation from its disrepute of teleology. Um, and so you sort of still have that, that, that problem after 1859. For a while, he says, um, biologists were pre prepared to say that turtles, uh, uh, the turtle came ashore and laid its eggs, but they refused to say that it came ashore to lay its eggs. You know, the biologists were being extremely careful about appealing um, um, to sort of a uh, purposive, purposive language. Um, and he notes that this is sort of uh, uh, unfortunate. He says, uh, nowadays, um, you know, we should, adaptation is, as we understand selection better, is, has, uh, has an improved sort of respectability. Um, selection is, is not, the process of selection is better understood. Um, so he says, you know, we, we, we should try to, um, to, it's a shame that teleology uh, should be resurrected. Instead, um, um, you know, what we should do is um, maybe use another term like teleonomic, and he coins the term, um, to, uh, to refer to all end-directed systems. Uh, in order to sort of dis distinguish or decouple it from the from this commitment to Aristotelian teleology as an efficient causal principle. Now, notice that this idea of an efficient causal principle is not one that I think you know Aristotelian scholars recognize in Aristotle. So it's already sort of uh, uh, you know distinguishing it from um, from the characterized view of of, um, of 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 Aristotle. So what happens? Uh, Dan, Dan, yes. sorry, but you, you've only got four minutes left. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So what happens after that? Well, you've got a number of uh, neo-Darwinian uh, biologists uh, sort of referring to, to this notion. Um, how do they refer it? What do they mean by it? Well, mostly in terms of adaptation, like, like, like Pittenbrook, right? So this is an example from, um, from Huxley um, saying, you know, the teleonomy enables us to think about evolution as not being directed. Uh, example from Simpson, again, saying we shouldn't use finalistic or teleological uh, language. This seems to be unsuitable uh, because evolution doesn't have a predetermined goal. Um, you know, we can, we, you can use the notion of teleonomy suggested by Pittendrick to refer to adaptation. And Williams, right, saying, you know, we should, we should use Pittendrick's term to designate the study of adaptation. It's a very important term because it distinguishes it from, um, uh, you know, from, 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 uh, from Aristotelian uh, sort of connotations. So the question then is, you know, what, what were really all neo Darwinists completely unaware of the problem of intrinsic purposiveness? Well, actually, no. If you look at the work, for example, of Dobzhansky, um, the way he writes actually um, suggests that he's, uh, you know, he's aware that living beings have an internal natural theology that needs to be explained, a teleology that is relevant to thinking about growth and development. Um, um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's really, he says, the most fundamental problem of biology. So how can we address it? He says, well, there's two ways. One is vitalism. We don't want to do that. The other one is through natural selection. Okay, so essentially he's saying intrinsic purposes, in addition to extrinsic purposes, can be explained by natural selection. Maya, um, sort of like Dobzhansky, recognizes also that intrinsic purposes is a, is a problem, but unlike Dobzhansky, he thinks that selection is not uh, up to the task of, 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 of explaining it. So this is why he suggests to, to you know, he, he thinks we shouldn't use teleonomy in this way to refer to selective value. Instead, it would be much more useful if we refer to it to solve the sort of unsolved, to address the unsolved problem of intrinsic purposiveness, you know, to explain the goal directedness of development and behavior. So he redefines the concept uh, to refer to uh, the operation of a program. And of course, this is, uh, this is when the notion of a linear program is, is coined. Um, uh, so he, he says, you know, that, that it's not related to natural selection, this notion of a program. Um, computers also have programs, so computers also teleonomic. Um, and really, by using teleonomy, then we sort of made legitimate the use of, 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 uh, uh, of, of purposive language. Jacob, uh, in reference to Haldane, says, you know, the concept of program has made an honest woman of teleology. Um, he then writes to Pittendrick to find out whether Pittendrick had the same ideas in mind about how we should uh, use the notion of, um, you know, uh, of teleonomy. Um, and Pittendrick replied, um, actually, I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm sorry about this. I'm just going to go. Um, very quickly, um, my, my point is that um, if we take, uh, so let me just go to the end, right. So um, the, so this, this is the end of my talk. So um, the concept of teleonomy, I think is not gonna be helpful for us for two reasons, okay? First one is because it means different things to different people as, we, as I've shown. And this inherent ambiguity has misled biologists into thinking that the problem has just been solved by using another term, by terminological decree. This is a quote from Hull that makes that apparent. Uh, today, the mistress has become, this is a reference again to Haldane's quip, the mistress has become a lawfully wedded wife. Biologists no longer feel ashamed about using the language, but the concession, the only concession they make is to use the term teleonomy. Obviously, this is not satisfactory. 
And you know, when we concretize its meaning and follow Maya and think about it you know, in terms of genetic program, it suffers from the conceptual and empirical deficiencies of the latter concept. There's a huge amount of literature on this uh, by both biologists and philosophers showing the problems with the notion of a genetic program. So essentially, if we associate teleonomy to genetic, the fate of teleonomy to the genetic program, we are basically, um, you know, it's not gonna help us because the genetic program model as has already been um, actually mentioned by some of the other uh, uh, speakers is not a, a helpful way of thinking about uh, uh, goal directedness and, and development because it obscures the role of genes in development. So my final slide, um, if teleonomy can't help us, then what should we do? Um, what can we do? Well, uh, first suggestion is to really recognize that organisms are not machines. I think that much of the confusion in defining, defining, not even solving it, defining the problem of purposefulness stems from this temptation to continuously ontologically assimilate to organisms, organisms to machines and expect but the way we explain the directedness or purposiveness of the latter suffices to explain the purposes of the former. And I've, I've argued that this is a mistake. And secondly, um, the idea I think which uh, is more promising is to think of purposiveness really as an empirical manifestation of the sort of particular causal organizational regime that organisms exhibit. Um, and so if this is the case, then the key to explaining organismic purposiveness lies in understanding organismic organization and efforts uh, in this uh, direction are already well on their way. So there's plenty of room to be optimistic. Thank you very much. And my apologies, I was a little over time. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, that was uh, very, very stimulating and uh, very interesting. Uh, I'd love to have a debate with you right now about certain points, but there's no opportunity, I'm afraid. Um, wonderful. Now we have to move on. Uh, it is indeed 2.30 or even 2.30 and a half. Uh, we have now argu arguably an even more challenging question from the brothers Raymond and Dennis Noble, London Ox and Oxford respectively, in their presentation, which has been, re been pre-recorded, Raymond and Dennis ask, physiology and telos, is teleology a sin? I am Dennis Noble at the University of Oxford. I'm and Raymond Noble at uh, University College London. And, and I'm a chartered biologist. What are you? I think I'm a physiologist uh, most of the time, really. <laughs> but both of us have some very uh, strong views on the question of this symposium, which is the role of teleology uh, in biological thought and whether it really should be brought back. And that's why we called our presentation um, uh, Teleology and Physiology. Is teleology a sin? So well, it's certainly, that's roughly right, isn't it? It, it actually right? is. So, <laughs> it's certainly the case that I was always taught that it was somewhat yeah. of a sin. And we were always taught to avoid purpose uh, when talking about something happening. Um, and um, I think people prefer functionality. If you say that something has a given function, people seem to sort of accept that more. But as soon as you start saying the purpose of X is to do Y, then uh, people start having difficulty with it, both from a philosophical point of view, but also from an empirical point of view. Um, so I, I actually think, I'm this, this, I'll try this on you. Yes. I think there's a problem that stems from confounding two different questions. They're related, but they are different and they're distinct. The one is, why does any particular happening, any particular function, um, any particular behaviour persist, type of behaviour persist in a population, let's say, um, this is sort of answering the question or addressing the question of purpose um, at an evolutionary level. So the gene-centric person might say that that particular type of behaviour or function exists in order to maintain genes in a gene pool. 
So they've decided that a particular goal is something that they're going to measure, which is the genes in a gene pool. Once you've decided that that is the case, of course, you've then got definitively a particular purpose, which is to maintain genes in a gene pool. Genes, of course, are maintained. They're not in a gene pool, they're in you and I, and they're in all the other organisms. And you call that the gene pool. Well, you call it a gene pool. The gene pool doesn't ipso facto become the objective. What really is the objective in that, if it's to maintain the genes in the gene pool, is to maintain the pool that the genes are in, which is you and I. Which is life. So you see, which is life, yes. exactly. So you've got this uh, fundamental problem of life, which is created by life, which is that it seeks to maintain its integrity. That's what life does. And in doing so, it addresses all the problems that it encounters in doing that. If it didn't address them, it wouldn't continue to survive. Now, it can address those at the instance of a, of a behaviour or a function, or it can address it over an evolutionary time period. Yeah. In other words, maintaining function might require changes in form and function over time, which of course leads to a creative evolutionary solution to a problem that is being encountered. We could call that environmental pressure, if you like, which the organisms respond to. But then there is the answer to the other kind of question, which is, let's say, why did Jack accompany Jill up the hill to fetch a pail of water? Now, you could say the answer to that is that Jack accompanied Jill in order to help Jill to fetch a pail of water. In other words, the objective was to fetch a pail of water. So the purpose of what they were doing was to fetch a pail of water. If I needed water and I saw Jill and Jack coming down the hill with a pail uh, with water in it, I might think, fantastic, they've achieved their objective, the purpose of going up the hill was to fetch a pail of water. Now, of course, I may be wrong. This is not about whether one is right or wrong yeah. in one's judgment about why something happened or why something happens. It's a question of the legitimacy of the very process of asking and answering that question. Is it important? to know why it is that Jack and Jill went up the hill. Well, it might be, because if we needed water, for example, and we saw Jack and Jill going up the hill, and we assumed that the purpose was to catch, uh, fetch yeah. a pail of water, we might depend upon that. This is a Life is like that. It has a contextual logic. It is a contextual it. dependence. It's a contextual yes, logic. That's right. Which, yes. which defines a, a, a purposefulness within that instance. It, they may never do that again. I mean, that may be the only time Jack goes up the hill with Jill. They may never do it again. It may have absolutely nothing to do with retaining genes in gene pools. But on the other hand, it might. Because it may be that one of the reasons Jack accompanied Jill up the hill was because Jack loved Jill. And Jack was courting Jill. And Jill took, uh, Jack took advantage of the fact that Jill was going up the hill to fetch a pail of water. I will go up and help Jill because that's a good way of uh, courting Jill. And so it's either like killing two birds with one stone. I go up there. Oh, incidentally, purpose, just because there is a purpose to something doesn't mean there aren't other purposes. Yeah, indeed. The purposes is, can be you multiple. You see this in physiological yes. function all the yes, time, don't indeed, you? Indeed, yes. But let's look at that. I mean, you might say, well, that's only to do with things that are outside the system. There may be many reasons why something happens. Yeah. Um, and many functions that are being fulfilled. Many purposes, if you like. Uh, and it would be too easy, I think, to think that we could only apply that logic of purpose to what an organism does. But we have to remember the organism does things through the faculty of being able to do things. What gives them that faculty are there, is the physiological functionality. Yeah. And therefore, that physiological functionality is also serving a purpose, which is to enable the organism to do the things it needs to do to maintain its integrity. Yeah. So, for example, if you could take an example, Dennis, the cardiovascular system. Right. Well, I think I can explain a little bit as to how function and purpose come into the way in which physiologists analyze uh, the, this kind of question. 
When I was working 60 years ago on aiming to reconstruct the rhythm of the heart with knowledge of the properties of around four iron channel mechanisms in the cells of the heart, I found a very interesting fact, which is that if you put all of those mechanisms into a model containing the constraining feature of the cell membrane where those iron channels are sitting, you can mathematically show that the properties of those iron channels automatically generates rhythm. That's what I published in 1960. But there's a very interesting outcome of that demonstration. It looks like a perfectly reductionist explanation because all of those mechanisms are well understood in terms of the dynamics of the process, except for the following fact. If you remove the cell membrane, you still have all the various proteins in place, perhaps in a dish out on the bench, you would not get rhythm. The rhythm is something which is produced as a constraint by the higher level of organisation. This introduced me to the following very important fact, which is one of our contributions to this symposium. You cannot attribute the function of and the purpose of producing the rhythm of the heart to the molecules of the heart. It wouldn't exist if only the molecules were there. You can only attribute, first of all, the idea of pacemaker rhythm to actual complete cells, and you can only attribute the function, and therefore the purpose, of it enabling the beating of the heart, and therefore the pumping of blood through the circulation, at an even higher level, which in this case is not only the whole heart, but actually the whole cardiovascular system. This is what led me to the idea that you have in the end to uh, recognise the existence of multiple scales of organisation in biology, and you can only attribute function and therefore purpose at this scale and level that is appropriate. If you stick to the molecular level, you won't see the functionality. Now, that applies across the board in physiology. I mean, the kidney, for example, I mean, system, you, exactly you can perhaps tell us something about that. Well, I used to always tell students, you know, that you could ask several questions to get a hang on, something to hang uh, ideas on in relation to the function of organ systems. Um, the renal system is a, a good example of this. If you could ask the question, what does it do? Um, how, in general terms, does it do it? And how is it structured in order to do it? What's its structure and functional relationship? Um, when you take the structure and functional relationship, you, you find an interesting idea about purpose. Um, in the renal system, you've got essentially a sieve. I mean, it's a wonderful sieve. There's sort of these thousands upon thousands of glomeruli uh, that form this extraordinary sieve uh, through which an awful lot can, can, can flow uh, with the pressure. And, but of course, what's also going through there, as well as there being the, the water and so on, are all the solutes. Now, some of those solutes, some of those salts, some of those iron species are required, they're needed. The organism cannot lose them, so it has to retrieve them. And there is an extraordinary structural relationship that enables that retrieval. Some of it is an active process of retrieval with channels within membranes that mm. will actively reabsorb. Others are to do with a unique concentration gradient that is established by a counterflow system uh, that enables the uh, concentration gradient to allow um, the ions to move down the concentration gradient from one side to the other, so that they retreat. This is an extraordinarily wonderful organisation. Uh, and that organisation has that purpose. It has the purpose of cleansing the blood, mm. retrieving the solutes that are required and needed by the blood. The renal system, incidentally, does a number of other things that relate to doing that as well, because it is also involved in controlling blood pressure uh, hormonally. But back to the fact that there are multiple purposes. There are multiple purposes, multiple functionality, if you yes. like. And within yes. each of that function, and once you decide that this is 
functionality yeah. you've got purposes within the logic of that functionality exactly. so yes. the purpose of this kind of cell the glomerular cell for example is to filter the blood yeah. I mean you know that gives it purpose and the, you know the design of it is extraordinary I mean you, you, know, you, you have to be very careful about using the word design yeah. but over an evolutionary period that um, evolutionary process which you and I believe yeah. is also a biological process with some degree of active engagement to it uh, because we are also selectors. We are our environment. The other, the other uh, um, silly thing, I think, or, or dangerous thing, is to separate the organism out from its environment. It's like the environment is a box and mm -hmm. the organism uh, just exists as an isolated organism and has no function in relation to the box uh, that you could understand that organism why it exists how it behaves and so on by studying it apart from the box in which it usually lives in now the box in which it usually lives in is the ecosystem yeah, it's interaction with other yes. organisms yes. it's not a box yeah. it's an interactive process and part of that active interactive process is what we would regard as evolutionary selection uh, because it isn't just simply evolving itself. It is also part of an environment which is yes. uh, applying pressure on the or, on the evolution of other organisms Indeed, so. and so on. So yes. it's an iteratively iterative process over Indeed. a long period of time, over generations. And so that becomes an active process because we as organisms select. Yeah. Uh, and um, that process of selection is becomes a creative process in the long term because it seeks to maintain our integrity. It seeks yeah. to answer the problems in the way of doing that that life experiences. Yeah. And it's within that context too that you can see that the notion of purposefulness is a valuable one. Yes, exactly. I think we can go a bit further because people sometimes <coughs> ask the question of physiologists like you and me what is the actual empirical utility of using purposeful explanations? And I think we can give two very good examples of that. One comes from the work of William Harvey, the other comes from the work of Charles Darwin. The William Harvey example is simply this. William Harvey showed centuries ago that the direction in which the blood of the veins moves um, up back towards the heart and the direction in which blood moves through the arteries down towards the extremities implies that there must be what he called porosities in the periphery of the uh, cardiovascular system. Of course he couldn't see them because he didn't have a microscope but only about 30 years later Malpighi was able to use a microscope and demonstrate capillaries. Capillaries were a prediction of Harvey's functional explanation of the working of the heart. That was a great illustration too of the fact that the fact that you cannot see something at the time you make the theory does not mean to say the theory is wrong. It made a very clear empirical prediction. It was eventually verified. Now I come to the interesting question yeah. of Darwin, because right. he did something very similar, you see. He puzzled over the fact that he attributed to organisms the ability to influence their evolution. In other words, he actually accepted the theory of the um, inheritance of acquired characteristics formulated, of course, amongst other people by Lamarck, but actually by biologists from time immemorial. Now, he puzzled about this so much between his origin of species in 1859 that about 10 years later he asked the question, well, wait a minute, how can that happen? That means that somehow the changes in my body are being communicated to the germline cells. Otherwise, how could it be inherited? So he produced a hypothesis, very similar in a way to Harvey. He said, well, there must be, he called them gemules, there must be particles that travel from my body down to the germline. Of course, we know that Weissman came in later and proclaimed the idea that there couldn't be such. Well, we've now found them. 
The people working on extracellular vesicles pouring out of cells functionally can be transmitted all the way down to the germline. RNAs and DNAs are in those little vesicles. We found Darwin's gemmules. It's almost exactly the same process in terms of the thinking through of the role of function in physiology as Harvey used when he supposed there must be anastomoses or porosities that eventually became identified as capillaries. Well, and so, of course, yes, no, absolutely. I mean, and you see, one of the things that's happened there is the um, introduction of the concept of the barrier that prevents in the organism influencing the germline. Indeed. Um, which had no empirical basis. There was no empirical basis for that, no. Uh, right. It was yes. inserted, yeah. in a sense, as a way of preventing the concept developing of yes. purposefulness uh, exactly in so. the way yes. in I think, organism I think you're absolutely works. right. And you know, the interesting thing, Ray, is that um, Weissen himself realised that, he, of course, he did these experiments of cutting the tails off mice and showing that down six generations you get no tailless mice born. But he knew that that was only proving the non-inheritance of a surgical mutilation. He knew that. There was no other evidence whatsoever. Absolutely so, right. So, you know, the, 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 that evolutionary perspective with the Wiseman Barry and so on, it, it, it has a problem at both ends. It has a problem in terms of what it is that's selecting. Yes. And so it, it wants to treat the selection process as um, an arbitrary... Passive. A purely person. passive. No, no yes. biological. You know, it's the most extraordinary yes. thing. You've got around you all this extraordinary active life, and yet it <laughs> cannot be active. It cannot be active. Without yes. one moment no, right. that we're talking about yes. in the history of life, it yes. can play no part yes. at all. Yes. Uh, other than maybe as humans, as breeders. Yeah, of that's right, of course, this is what... We could then do that. Exactly. Mm. And that, of course, is the difference between Darwin's idea of artificial selection, which of course is what the breeders were doing, and of course he then used that <laughs> as a metaphor yes. for natural selection. There is no actual selection involved in uh, natural selection. But the interesting thing is that there also he thought about that very carefully later in life, and this whole question of whether it could also occur in organisms other than humans and of course it's what led in eventually to his idea of sexual selection and then of course generally speaking to social but when, selection but when you also th yes that's right and when you also think of the fact that <clears throat> organisms are in the process of niche creation they create the niche we live in of course they do look at us sitting we in here the whole environment this wonderful room that keeps us warm yeah. regardless yeah. of what the temperature is outside actually exactly. it's quite that's warm outside creation yes. but the point here is that <clears throat> that is an active process we build a nest uh, organisms are doing this all the time. That is their environment. Yeah. They are active in creating that environment. They are active in creating this supposedly passive sieve yeah. that determines whether something survives or not, that determines whether something is going to persist. And this is why I go back to that original thing, yes. the fact that yes. there are two types of question in relation to purpose. Indeed so, why yes. does something persist yes. and why does something happen in an instant? Yes. Why is it happening within that con context? Yes. And they can be different answers to those questions. Exactly so. It exists because it contributes to the survival of the organisms and the population of organisms. Yes. And the maintenance of life. And the maintenance of yes, life. Exactly. That's why it exists. Yes. That is not a passive process. Exactly so. It's an active process. So, in a sense, within that overall scheme, organisms have purpose. Exactly so. So, just to wrap up our presentation okay. uh, for the meeting, um, we asked the question, uh, in physiology we can't do without referring to the purpose of this organ, that organ, this system, that system, and so on. And we also believe that evolutionary biology also needs to take that into account. So to the question, is teleology a sin? No, it's an absolutely necessary, it's a necessary. form of explanation in biology. And it leads to point. different, it leads to different, the answers lead to different constructs that leads to different experimental paradigms. For example, go back to your example, I just want to finish with this then. Yes, because sure. I think it's going back to an example Please. you've had about Harvey and the circulatory system.
Yeah. The idea that there were valves that assist blood flow back to the heart. The problem exactly, that yes. one has is that, yes, the pressure is sufficient in most circumstances to generate a blood flow. And that pressure is generated by the heart pumping against yeah. the resistance of the circulatory system. But it is not sufficient in all circumstances to ensure that there is a sufficient flow of blood back to the heart. Yeah. And if that should fail, the whole system fails. Exactly. Harvey yeah. came to the idea that indeed there were valves, anatomically yeah. he could see indeed. them. But he also yeah. showed their functionality. You would not do those experiments if you do not believe that there was a purpose in those valves to help return the blood to the heart. Exactly so. And that's why physiology needs teleology. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I thought that was great. <laughs> What can you say after that? Wonderful duo. Um, we actually have a little gap.